good evening. I'm Susan Howington, your guest host of Eye on Business this evening. And I'm really pleased to have as a guest of mine, Debbie Holzkamp. Debbie is the CEO and founder of a, an exciting academic endeavor called Sales to Jobs Academy. Debbie, tell us about Sales to Job Academy. Absolutely. So Sales to Job Academy is bridging the gap between employers looking for qualified sales candidates and Americans looking for job security. Uh, employers are reluctant to hire people who have little sales experience and people who have no, no formal training. And so, um, you know, it can be a very expensive proposition. Mm -hmm. uh, Americans are looking for alternatives. They don't necessarily want to go back to a four-year degree school mm -hmm. and learn uh, sales or formal sales training. And most of the 4,300 universities and colleges across America don't offer a formal sales training program. So we have, we have the solution. We're an alternative career school, and we exist to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and from what I understand, you are accredited. You have a very rigorous curriculum. Yes, we do. Uh, it is instructor-led. The students have homework, and they are graded. Yes, So they tell are. us a little bit more about that. OK. So it's an uh, instructor-led, uh, five-week, 15-session, college-level program. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing that students do is they go through uh, a highly predictive sales assessment that will show them promising matches to sales career roles. And those roles include any, anywhere from a, a strategic account manager mm -hmm. to a, a system sales specialist to new business developer to a dealer sales representative. It's a whole variety. And once, once they determine that promising match and the competency skills that they natural, naturally possess, we then put them on a course uh, track. And over that course, uh, they take uh, uh, 15 sessions. There's a career uh, track. There's a technology track. There's a, a sales uh, process track. And they, they um, you know, it's, it's very rigorous uh, work. It's, uh, it's um, certified uh, instructor group. Uh, and our goal is to get them demonstrated certified and ready to uh, land in one of those roles that they desire and perform at a very high level. Terrific. You had once said to me in passing that you felt that a sales career provides job stability, career stability. Yes. You know, that's a rare find these days with a lot of functional areas in a company. Yes. So what's your thought on career stability as it relates to sales professionals? Yes. So in this, in this program, uh, we do a variety of things to give people the sales career uh, security and that income uh, mm -hmm. level. Um, and it starts with that highly predictive sales assessment. Nobody's really doing that um, profiling. So once you know what your true match is right there, um, to then focus on that, on really demonstrating the skills and, and, and going through a rigorous program, and then having 13 assignments uh, graded for competency skills and being able to show that to an employer, mm -hmm. show that. Uh, uh, and, and so once you become certified after the five weeks, you're now set to hit the ground running mm -hmm. and perform at a very high level. And so when you get into that role, you have the skills, you have the certification, you have the profile match. You're setting yourself up for job security mm -hmm. and income security into the future. Mm -hmm. Terrific. So the first sales job that someone has if, after they've completed your program is they have to get themselves a job, right? Yes, yes they So do. that's the ultimate sales challenge. Yes. But your company or your academy, from what I understand, you do a very active, you play an active role in bringing employers to the students that have completed the, the curriculum. And, and in, in addition, from this uh, determining where the person best fits in a sales role, you can guide the company to the perfect candidate yes. in reality. Absolutely. So uh, the whole career track part of this school is really, really important. And so people are selling themselves right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And we're helping them to sell themselves and, and engage with that employer. And it starts with that profile matching. Uh, you know, Power Connections, Inc., yeah, you, you help uh, 
lead us through one of the career tracks. You're, you're, you're helping um, candidates uh, and students in our class actually build their LinkedIn profile brand mm -hmm. and highlighting those competencies, those skill sets that match the employer so that when the employer is actually engaging with them and looking at their, at their overall profile, it, it certainly matches the role. So they're selling themselves through um, their, their social media, their LinkedIn profile. They're selling themselves through, uh, they have to learn how to do a 50 second brand, personal brand about themselves and the value that they bring. And we're introducing them along the way. We're networking. We have a huge network of employers and we're introducing them and networking them to those specific roles that they desire to land in. And so yes, we bring the employers to them and we bring the candidates to the employers. Perfect. I love what you do, Debbie. I love the fact that you're fueling the economy. You're providing a track for people for uh, a uh, per career that will lead to success for them. You're teaching them a ter terrific skill that will serve them well for the rest of their lives. So thank you very much for being with us today. I hope you'll come back and join us and tell thank us how you. you're progressing thank with you, this endeavor. Thank you, Thank you, Susan. And thank you. I'm Susan Howington, and we appreciate you joining us on Eye on Business. I'm Debbie Holskamp. I'm CEO and founder of Sales to Job Academy, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hi, I'm Susan Howington, your host on Eye on Business, and I'm very pleased to have with me Sherelle Jackson. Sherelle, welcome to Eye on Business. We're happy to have you here. Hi, Susan. Thank you. You're welcome. Sherelle, you are a, a force to be reckoned with in my world view. You are the partner and COO, CFO of a large public accounting firm called Squire Milner. Yes? Yes, I am. And uh, not only that, you're a very active woman, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But first, let's talk about your business life. You've been with Squire for a long time. Tell us what you do. Tell us about the firm, and what do you want us to know? Well, I've been with Squire Milner now, as you mentioned, for a long time, almost 18 years. Mm -hmm. I'm a partner of the firm and the chief financial and operating officer. Uh, we are a regional CPA firm. We're in the top 50. Um, I do a lot of mergers and acquisition. In fact, just finished up two mergers, and I'm on the heels of closing another merger with opening multiple offices in the Bay Area. Just opened an office and expanded our Encino office, and nice. one in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And then we have our headquarters in Newport Beach, mm -hmm. offices in San Diego and L.A. counties. My goodness. And I take care of all of the operations, finance, accounting, HR, administration, and IT. Wow. How many people do you have in your firm? In our firm now, we're a little over 350. We'll be over 500 by January 1. Oh my goodness. Yes. So you're growing? Growing tremendously. It is very, very busy. That's fabulous. Yeah. So in terms of a, the perfect client for Squire Milner, can you give us a profile? What kind of people, companies are you looking for? Well, we're a full-service accounting firm, and what makes Squire Milner so amazing is that we provide you the big firm service as it relates to the level of talent that we have with our partners and our professional staff as well. We service almost all industries from manufacturing and distribution, public and private work. Mm -hmm. We're in the hospitality, entertainment, real estate, restaurants, and on and on and on. Uh, we, it's not so much what services or what industries do we serve, but it's the industries that we don't serve. Mm -hmm. And we're primarily across the globe in all services. We do public work as far as audits, we do tax work, business litigation, forensic accounting, business management, all things that have to do with money, financial services, mm -hmm. and wealth advisors. Very nice. If you could describe the culture of Squire, Squire Milner, I've, I've had the benefit of hearing you speak a number of times, and uh, you bring something, I think, to the company yourself, but what's the culture there? Tell us about what, what does one experience at your firm? Well, Squire Milner is a, is a special environment in that we're not your typical accountants. It is a work hard, play hard environment. Mm -hmm. We are an organization that is thriving. We believe in providing high quality service and creating a great place where people like to work. Mm -hmm. We appreciate attracting excellent talent, so we pay a premium for our talent compared to our competition. Mm -hmm. And then the client base that we have has an opportunity to get top level service with a boutique experience.
So we're set apart from most of the firms. We compete with the D, the E and Y and Deloitte and, mm -hmm. and uh, the other big name firms. So mm -hmm. we're typically in that space, and it is really a great place to work. But we work hard, mm -hmm. Susan, as you know, yeah. and we play hard. Yeah, good. There's a lot to being Sherelle Jackson. There's a lot about you that is... Um, tremendously full and robust. And so if, if uh, being the COO and CFO partner of Squire Milner wasn't enough, there's another part of you that is very active in the community. You are a keynote speaker. You are a member of boards. And why don't we learn a little bit about that? What boards are you on right now? Well, I love the community, mm -hmm. and when you describe me, whether it's my professional or my personal life, I'm built to serve, mm -hmm. and um, I love making a difference in the lives of others. So currently, I'm sitting on the board of Human Options, and I also sit on the board of Big Brothers, uh, Big Sisters of Orange County and the Inland Empire, mm -hmm. and then I serve on a number of advisory committees with Concordia and with uh, Cal State Fullerton's uh, Leadership um, Advisory Committee and then a, a few other mm -hmm. organizations in mm -hmm. our community. But the bottom line is that it's important that we use our life to make a difference. And I think as a leader, whether it's in business or in community, that's what our primary purpose is. Well, I want our viewers to know that you're also the founder creator of a nonprofit called Leadership in Heels. And I think that title is very provocative. So tell us about that. Well, Leadership in Heels is a speaker series that is really designed for people to take their life to the next level. And I believe that if you have one person in your life that you influence, then you are a leader. And therefore, you belong at, to attend a Leadership in Heels event. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, it was originally designed for women, by women, mm -hmm. for the sole purpose of making a difference in a woman's life. But as we've grown with Leadership in Heels, since 2015, we've really discovered that women and men are better together. Mm -hmm. And when a woman is better, then together we're better. Mm -hmm. My managing partner, Steve Milner, is a man. Um, I have the privilege of, of running the operations. And I believe that when you invest in the women in your organization, the organization does nothing but thrive. Mm -hmm. And so at Leadership in Heels, we provide themes that are aligned not only with your professional life, but professional and personal and community. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that oftentimes we compartmentalize our lives. Mm -hmm. And if we can really take our life and integrate it, then we're more effective. We also highlight a person in business at each event. And then we donate a portion of our net proceeds to a nonprofit. Very nice. When I think of you, Sherelle, and all of your business and your your work in the nonprofit and and all of the activities that I, I see that you participate in, I think of you as having a huge relevancy cachet, if there is such a term. You're so relevant, and you're so contemporary, and you're so well-rounded. You're so knowledgeable because of these things. But we can't all be Sherelle Jackson, right? Right, right. I'd like to try, but I think I would fail miserably. So if you were to give me or uh, one of our viewers some advice about how how do you build your relevancy cachet? How do you become this well-rounded person who's informed and active and doing something that has uh, makes a contribution? What would you say? You know, Susan, um, I appreciate a, the, the compliment. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. But to your point, um, although I know that you were being funny about it, the key is that first you have to get to know yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that nobody can be themselves better than you. Mm -hmm. And so in order for us to be the most effective, we have to get in touch with who we are and be authentic mm -hmm. about who we are. I mean, oftentimes we mer wear a mask. We operate in a sense of fear. And I believe that it's okay to be afraid, yeah. but don't move according to how you feel. Move mm -hmm. according to what your end goal is. Mm -hmm. And in regards to really being relevant, once you make a decision on who it is that you are and or who it is that you want to be, make sure that the steps that you take are aligned with those end goals. And that's where you get the satisfaction. And I think that when we are more fulfilled within, mm -hmm. then we can make a positive impact on others. And so you don't have to be Sherelle Jackson. You just have to be your authentic self. Then you become effective and you make a difference. Wonderful. What a great way to close this interview. Thank you for those words of wisdom. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you for being with us on Eye on Business. Thank you, Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Howington, special guest host. Hi, I'm John White, author of What You Don't Know About Listening Could Fill a Book. And you're watching Eye on Business. 
on Eye on Business. And I'm pleased to say that we're going to be interviewing a, a president of a company who has a huge f uh, international footprint in the enterprise resource planning software industry, more commonly known as ERP software. Joey Benedretti, welcome to the show. Great. Thank, thanks, Susan. Thank you for having me on. Happy to have you. Tell us a little bit about your company. You're the president of a U.S.-based company called CISPRO. Right. So, um, CISPRO Impact Software, um, we're part of a big global enterprise. Um, we're a true end-to-end -end, um, software company that deals with manufacturers and distributors, um, primarily in the SMB space, but we've got really large customers out there. Mm -hmm. And we concentrate in a variety of industries. The great thing, I guess, about being in Southern California as our U.S. headquarters is that there's such diversity. So we do a lot of in medical device, mm -hmm. in the food industry, in automotive, in machinery and equipment, electronics. Mm -hmm. um, and it's exciting. We really like it. Excellent. Um, you have built a very global and loyal customer base. Can you give us some idea of how, how have you gone about doing that? You've been in business a long time but you've really uh, developed a wide and variety of businesses throughout the globe. Right. I think the key is to be customer-centric. And mm -hmm. to start to be customer-centric, you've got to look at where, where you lie, right? And for us at CISPRO, the very basis of our customers is our first-line customer is the person next to you. Because you cannot um, deal really well on the outside unless you orchestrate well on the inside. Mm -hmm. So for me, my first-line customer or people in cubicles around me. Mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got to uh, look after them in every instance of everything. And if we work well together, then the customer on the outside can benefit. So we have different layers. Obviously, you know, we've got our employees. But on the outside, we have our channel partners and we have our end user customers. Um, many of them go across different countries um, and some pretty sophisticated environments. But the core of everything is to be customer centric. And your customers recognize that, I think, when, when they feel and understand that internally you have that culture, right? It, that comes out. It's displayed in the way that you're interacting with your customers. Oh, sure. I hope so. That means I don't get good calls from my customers, right? Of course, yeah. <laughs> no, we do. We, we have, you know, we, we got really high customer um, satisfaction. We got one of the highest customer retention rates in the industry, Fabulous. which I'm really pleased about. But we work hard for customers. Mm -hmm. It's not just about servicing them. It's about understanding them. It's about putting yourself in their shoes every day and seeing what they go through. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about customer centricity, it's about understanding from their side everything that, that goes on. So how do you get evaluated by a customer? It's on perception, right? Mm -hmm. They don't really know what happens or what you're doing for them but they perceive certain things. Mm -hmm. So the key to good customer um, relations in every form is good communication. Excellent. And not only outwardly, but also internally. Oh, absolutely. Internally. Yeah. Absolutely. You, yeah. you, but it starts with fundamentals. You've got to have great ethics. Mm -hmm. you know, you've got to have an appreciation for your customers. I tell, tell our staff all the time, our customers pay our checks. It's a question of respect. But the number one ingredient, number one out of everything, is you've got to build trust. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you build trust, your customers will trust you. Mm. So when we look at things like, um, you know, some of our core principles, you know, everybody's got them. Um, I'll start with relationships before the transaction. You know, it's a tough one. Because mm. you, but if you treat people well, they'll be loyal. Mm. If you're professional, they're going to be there. If you care about others... Um, you're going to have an environment that's going to stick with you. And th those are very, very strong things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Joey, in business we know that there is what we call the war on talent. It's very difficult to bring in good talent into a, a company. So what, what does CISPRO do to attract the kind of talent that would have these uh, people that are customer-centric, that are trustworthy, loyal? What do you do to attract that kind of person? You know, that's a really good question. I think it's one of those hard ones. But I think it's a process. Mm -hmm. You know, the way I look at everything, um, the way into a company is a really small door, mm -hmm. and the way out is a really big one. Mm -hmm. So if you interview well and you and you stick to the right principles. For us, it's very simple. Right people, right seats. Mm -hmm. If you choose the wrong people and you put them in, 
in the seat that you think they're going to be on, it's never going to work. You've got to find the right people. Um, we're very fortunate that we have um, a large number of employees that have stuck with us for many, many years. I think this year um, we, we actually really look after our customers. We've got um, our internal customers, our employees here. We've got seven that will be with us 20 years. How about that? Um, you know, last year we had a whole bunch as well. But it can't just be the, the people that have been with you forever. You have mm -hmm. to attract the millennials mm -hmm. because they bring in fresh thought, yes. fresh ideas. As much as we may joke about how hard they are, they're, they're inspirational and um, they a joy of life to have. That's because terrific. they make things better. Mm. Great. If you were to look at your employee population, do you have a sense of how many are in that millennial group and that you've been brought, bringing in in recent years? Oh, I could sum it up in one word. Enough. Enough. Okay. <laughs> no, we have quite a few. Good. We really Good. do. Good. Excellent. You know, in certain departments, you're going to find more than others. So um, typically around your marketing side, which has got a lot of social media and new type things, you know, mm -hmm. um, the young ones really um, get attracted to that. In technology, um, they're really quick on the uptake in mobile and things. And remember, you know, CISPRO is a company that, you know, we provide our solutions on premise, on mobile, and in the cloud. Excellent. So they, they get driven to certain areas, and they like Excellent. that. If you were described to describe your company's culture in one, two, or three words, how would you, what words would you select? You know, I, I think culture is really about an ecosystem, and you attract people that um, reflect the management and leadership of a company. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I'd put into one, two or three words, but I would really say it's about an ecosystem. It's about attracting people with like-minded approaches. Mm -hmm. But um, a culture at CISPRO is a comfortable culture. It's a professional culture. It's one built on um, a family orientation in a, in a lot of ways. But it's also built on success and it's built on um, looking forward. Mm -hmm. You know, there's got to be inspiration in what you're doing and there's got to be um, a desire to win out there and there's got to be a desire to feel good about what you do. Excellent. So with that comes um, our culture is built on our customers. It's a customer first centric culture. Terrific. Well in closing, Joey, I want to thank you for being our guest today. I want to thank you for what your company does in helping businesses be more efficient, proficient, and ultimately profitable and successful. And also, I want to express my appreciation for all the exciting opportunities that you give people. You fuel our economy by hiring people and giving them great work to do. So thank you for being on our show. Uh, thank you, Susan. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you for viewing Eye on Business. Okay. My name is Sherelle Jackson. I'm the partner, COO, and CFO of Squire Milner, and the CEO and founder of Leadership in Heels. And you are watching Eye on Business. Good evening. I'm Susan Howington, host of Eye on Business this evening. And I'm really pleased to have my good friend and colleague, John White. John is an international executive coach and leadership development specialist. He is um, an author. He is many things, actually, a composer, a playwright, and the list goes on and on, John. <laughs> but tonight we're going to be focusing in on a book that you've recently written that's called What We Know About Listening Could Fill a Book. Exactly. John, you have coached CEOs all over the world. Um, you've probably seen and heard everything. At what point, was there a point in time when you started to see the thread or you started to connect the dots that listening was um, at the root of a lot of leadership pain and deficits? Well, it actually happened with my own leadership. I was the, um, an executive at a medical device company, and I got some feedback that I was not very consensual. Mm. And so I started doing research about that. I was concerned about that perception. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I found that uh, listening is a core behavior to being perceived as being consensual, empathetic, and also research shows that it's essential for being strategic. Hmm. So uh, some people skills as well as business skills. So I was on a crusade then for another oh, three decades really to try to figure out how to become a better listener myself. Mm -hmm. And when I started coaching others, I found they have difficulty changing that behavior. Hmm. So I had to find a way to simplify it so adults that have learned listening from the time they were a child, how they can now change that in their executive leadership behavior and become more effective. Excellent. What are some symptoms, if you will, of poor listening abilities in a leader or a leadership team? 
there's several that really stand out. And I would say when I would go in to consult with a firm about leadership or if I was coaching somebody, I would find listening as a root cause of some of these situations about 40% of the time. Mm. It could be that there's a lot of passive aggressive behavior. Mm. So there's frustration. People are not really hearing each other. Mm. It could be that we're not meeting our goals, uh, Mm. that uh, we're not clear about instructions or expectations and being able to get things done. Also, I kind of specialized in companies that are going through gigantic change. Mm -hmm. And when followers don't follow in the midst of change, very often it's because there's no listening going on. Mm -hmm. So I was seeing it pretty much everywhere. And it was just trying to diagnose whether that was one of the key uh, failings at that time for the individual or the organization. Mm -hmm. I I love your book. I use it in my own practice. But Uh getting a little granular, granular, you uh, mentioned that a uh, poor... Uh, listening technique is using eye contact as a as a uh, as a factor for effective listening, and I'm guilty of that. So I had to wince a little bit. No, so tell no, us about that. I think that you use bit. it in a good way. And yeah. I, it's not that it's a poor uh, behavior. Mm-hmm. It's just that we rely upon it. We think that we're forming the bond. Listening has really two purposes. Mm -hmm. One is to collect information. The other is Mm -hmm. to prove to the other person that we actually care enough that we're listening. Mm -hmm. And eye contact doesn't do the second at all. Mm -hmm. We can actually sort of zone out while we're making eye contact. And I look like I'm listening to you, but I'm not really. So what we want to do is substitute behaviors that really show the other person that we're listening. And that's why Yes, it's still good to make eye contact. It's, it's a matter of human warmth. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's good to affirm by going, uh-huh, like you just mm-hmm. did. Mm-hmm. To me, that's a good thing to do as well. But it doesn't prove that you're listening. Right. Listening helps with communication for a lot of obvious reasons. But I love what you say about using the word what to replace why. Yes. So what is it about what that takes preference over why? It's just on the array of words that you could use to begin a question it is more neutral. We're programmed neurolinguistically from a very young age to react to certain words. And when we were little, our parents often said, why'd you do that? Mm-hmm. And even with the tone, they're conveying that this is not going to turn out well. Mm-hmm. So as we get older, that's implanted there by our parents, our teachers, a spouse, a boss. And every time they ask us why, we know some sort of punishment is going to follow. Now, it's happening on a subliminal level. Mm -hmm. But what we want to try to do is neutralize language so we avoid any of that. Is this a silver bullet? Does it make every conversation better? No. Mm -hmm. But if we use what, and we've researched this kind of all around the world, and almost every language, when a question is asked with the word why, it creates some defensiveness in human Mm. beings. And we know that what is much more neutral. The second most neutral word is how. But the difference between what and how is about this big, and then why is way out here on the Richter scale. Mm -hmm. So what's the best word? And it just takes practice, and any Mm -hmm. question could be asked that way. Yeah. I I also believe that what opens up the answer a little bit more. It does. It's very open-ended. And Mm -hmm. that's the second characteristic of a great question, is that it's Mm open-ended. So it causes the other person to speak. When I ask ask you a what question and you have to say more, I must have liked what you were saying. I've invited you to speak. That's a good sign. Mm-hmm. That's good Absolutely. conversation. Yeah. Well, the good news is from, from what I've learned is that good listening skills can be learned. It's something that we can ad- adopt in, in our lives and we can see results rather quickly. Yes, we can. But the best way, of course, is to learn the skills and practice them and try them in a very safe place. Go to somebody we really like and trust and try having a conversation, have it go well. Uh, Adult learners don't learn well when they go someplace that's very threatening and Mm -hmm. fail. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is learn the three characteristics of a great question, take it to a great uh, relationship, practice it till you're comfortable and then start gradually using it elsewhere. We actually think to learn it and sustain it for an adult human being takes about six months. Okay. So yes, you can learn quickly, but will you retain it? Will you use it under fire? Mm-hmm. It takes a little longer. So it takes some work, yes. but it's worth it. Oh, I think it is in, in business and personal relationships both. Excellent, John. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're us. welcome. Good to see you again, Thank Susan. you for your good work. Thank you. Teaching us all how to be better listeners. Happy to. And thank you for joining us on Eye on Business. Hi, I'm Susan Howington, and you're watching Eye on Business. Hi, Paul. Hi, Susan. Nice to have you with us today. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Paul Brubaker. Paul is a human resources executive, 
and Paul is here to talk to us about winning cultures. Now before we get started, I think it's worth noting that you have a rather unique background for a human resources executive in that you've actually been an executive in operations as well as finance before you even became an, uh, an HR guy, right? That, that is right. Yeah. 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 So I think that builds a really <clears throat> great platform for you, for you to talk about winning cultures, because you've seen it from, you know, the 360 degree of view of looking at a company. Yeah. So a winning culture is probably not exclusive to just certain functions within a business. It probably uh, encompasses the whole thing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Cr critical yeah. to the business. Good. So, Paul, what is a winning culture, and why is it important? Well, and, and I'll start out with the, the finance and, and operations of it. It's, um, you know, as leaders, we need to create a culture that brings out the best in our people. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? Well, what's our most expensive uh, cost on our income statement? It's people, mm -hmm. right? Most often. Yes. Um, and because of that, and, and, and then you've got this low engagement, right? And, and people are, you're getting 70% mind share instead of 100%. Yeah. So if, you, if you're really good, you're getting up towards 100. And if you're not very good, you're, you're way down there. So basically you're spending 100, the salary doesn't go up and down by how engaged they are, it stays. Yes. So if you can just get people to move up toward that 100% engagement level, mm -hmm. then you got a better investment in your people. Mm -hmm. So by getting a winning culture, getting that engagement, you're actually putting money onto the bottom line. Interestingly, today I read that Gallup's latest poll said only 21% of employees strongly agree with the statement that their performance is managed in a way that motivates them to do outstanding work. Is that right? 21%. Jeez. So, you know, scary, that I think. It is scary, yeah. yeah. So it's really important. Yeah. So what are some keys to creating a winning culture? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's really about the leader, mm -hmm. and, and not just the leader of the company, but the leader of every group. Yeah. Um, and some will use the word manager, and I'll just use it interchangeably as, as we talk, but um, it's, the first thing you got to do is build trust. Mm -hmm. and, and so how do you do that is, is the big question. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the leader needs to be humble and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is if you believe you are the only one that has the good idea yeah. and that your idea is right, mm -hmm. why do you have your people? Right. right. So you've got all these brains. People are looking at things differently. It gets to diversity of viewpoint. If you don't bring that diversity to the table and hear other people's view and, and then work toward a common solution that people can buy into. So you've got to build that trust. And by, by being vulnerable, you do that. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got to, of course, listen. Yes. And take some action. And when people, your team, start to see, oh, they actually heard me. We're actually rolling down this road together. I'm going to help make that happen. Mm -hmm. So they get committed to the process, and they get excited about it, and they sure. get accountable for it. Sure. Um, and, and then the le as the leader, you've got to go break down the barriers to make sure that that project or process gets implemented and things move forward. So that's kind of your job as the leader. Um, and then you come back and you give credit. Perfect. You give credit. It, it, you know, Perfect. celebrate. Yeah, I think it's important so. that, they, that employees actually see you demonstrating what it is that you're professing, you know, and also that you are executing. That's important as well, isn't it? Totally. You, you've got to deliver results mm -hmm. um, for the company and the, and the people don't feel fulfilled if they don't see the results. Right. So you use the word winning in, in winning culture. Uh, I think we all have our, our own definition of win, but how do you define the word yeah. win? And I like to use two words, actually, win and have fun. Okay. Have fun and win. Perfect. It, it's very much a virtuous cycle. So you can have fun at work. Uh, I, I have fun every, every day at work. Perfect. There's challenging situations that I don't like as well. I'm still having fun because as long as I feel I'm adding value. Great. But you don't know if you're winning unless you have metrics in place. Mm. So you've, you've got to have metrics. You've got to be sharing your metrics. And people got to know when you're, you know, when you're accomplishing what you're set out to do, your mm -hmm. targets. And uh, once you do, then, then everybody can rally around that. You can recognize people. You can celebrate when you, when you hit the numbers. Um, 
and, and that's one part of winning. And then the other part is winning with people. Mm -hmm. And if the company starts to win, then you grow and there's opportunity and there's opportunity for growth. And even if the whole company isn't, you can move people within your group right. and give them opportunities to grow. And what I've seen is you can really attack a uh, turnover problem. Um, you can attack, you know, the, the cultural problem of, of just people that are unhappy coming to work. And all of a sudden, your, your team is, it's not all of a sudden, it's quite a process, but you start to notice that there's a whole different feel of your team as people say, you know, sure. wow, I can grow in this job. I can add value to this company. And, and then that's when the fun comes in because sure. now, now you, you're having fun watching them grow. You're having fun because the company's growing and making money. Absolutely. So it's, it's the virtuous cycle, win and have fun. Absolutely. Wonderful. Okay. In closing, Paul, your professional tagline is leading change, inspiring others. I believe that your view and perspective on creating a winning culture is very much in alignment with your professional brand. So kudos to you. It, it all fits. And I love your passion and your expertise in winning cultures. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure having you. And thank you for viewing Eye on Business. My name is Mark Mitchell, director for the TriTech Small Business Development Center, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hi, I'm Susan Howington, host of Eye on Business, and I'm so pleased to have my guest today being Britt Barber. Britt is the owner, CEO, founder, and designer of Beach Candy Swimwear. Britt, you are a, a sensation in your space. You have uh, swimwear all over the world, you. and you have a unique story, and I would do it disservice by telling it. So would you tell our viewers a little bit about your company, please? Of course. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. um, I own Beach Candy Swimwear. I started the company over seven years ago. We exist to make sure that every woman feels her best in a swimsuit. That's what inspired me in the first place, and I've been working at this dream for over 10 years. Um, we have women every age, size, shape in the store. We design custom swimwear, but we also sell our ready-to-wear swimwear. So you sell custom swimwear. We do. How in the world do you do that? Every woman's body is different, as we know, and swimwear is tricky. Absolutely. Um, that's what inspired me in the first place. I have a background in sewing, pattern making, and just design in general. And uh, again, I'm inspired by making sure every woman feels her best in a suit. So um, it started with, with making custom suits, and our ready-to-wear collection is based off of exactly what our custom clients order. So it's based off of what real women want by real women. And so it's really a listening. I don't really do trends. I do classic styles and cuts that make women feel great in a swimsuit. Mm -hmm. I understand that you have a fashion degree from the Pratt Institute in New York. Yes. And I've always wondered, in the active wear, the clothing line, there are so many pieces of clothing you could be designing. Why did you pick swimwear? It seems like such a narrow focus. Absolutely. I, uh, swimwear lights me up. What I love about it most is uh, the psychology mixed with it. When a woman puts on a swimsuit, she's not in lingerie, in candlelight with her partner. She's in the sunshine with family, friends, new dates, you know, boyfriends. There's a convergence of insecurities and um, feeling of lack. And so I'm always trying to make sure women feel their best, feel alive, feel sexy, feel confident, and uh, don't doubt themselves in a swimsuit. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to admit, um, swimsuit shopping is not my favorite thing to do. And I think I speak for a lot of women. It is, it's a horrid experience for many of us. Right. I mean, if you were to ask me to go shopping today, I'd say, great, where are we going? If you said, let's go uh, shop for swimwear, you know, I'd probably think of a dentist appointment or something that I exactly. needed to go to. Or and, paired with happy hours. Yeah, exactly. Right. So to, to hear you express your passion around making women feel confident and beautiful in swimwear, I mean, truly, I think that's a difference about who you are and what you translate into the swimwear that you make. At least it has to be because your swimwear is a sensation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I understand also that wherever your swimwear is sold, it sells out. And you're all over the world in beautiful stores, right. beautiful retail. Yes. But you've got a new strategy, I understand, about how to get your swimwear to the women of the world. 
Absolutely. I just kind of try and head, you know, uh, broach the issue with women all shapes and sizes so they get that they're not left behind, they don't have to leave their cover up on, that they're not forgotten, and that's why I get up in the morning. That's what I think about before I go to bed every night is how to make sure that women get it, that they can feel fabulous in a suit absolutely you know after children and after life happens and, and our bodies change that's when we shine most perfect you not only sell in retail spaces but you sell online how is that possible to sell a custom suit online it is one of our focuses every day to make sure that the message gets across that again it's not just another flat screen with a girl in a swimsuit so uh, every day we're working on um, each product has, you can choose the coverage options, so skimpy or full, tops with pads, without pads. And then we also have a custom quiz online where women can describe what it is that holds them back from wearing a suit. Is it tummy issues? Is it arms, thighs? All mm -hmm. the issues that women feel when swimsuit shopping. Mm -hmm. And then I've started to fit women over FaceTime. So we make them a custom mm. fits garment. We send it to the client wherever they are in the world. We fit over FaceTime. And the result uh, is is astounding. It's a perfect swimsuit. I get um, these testimonial emails that just make me feel like it's all worth it. So it's wonderful. Your passion and your vision is being met. Yeah. And you have the stories to prove that, too. Thank you. So um, you, you must have the measurements, though, down to a simple science for women to use. I mean, they've got to measure themselves for these Absolutely. custom suits. So right. how did you come up with this system? Well, I just noticed patterns. So mm -hmm. again, every time I heard a certain want or need from a woman, I documented it. Mm -hmm. So I have an absolute documentation of exactly what women want and I can just listen to language over the phone and kind of know what they need and feel and and want from a swimsuit so I pair that with their measurements and after you know years and years of doing this I, I have just really synthesized down um, different body issues and what different women want because no woman's body is the same mm -mm, but mm -mm. there are very, very there are similarities if you really pay attention and listen Interesting. Uh, your website is beautiful, Thank and you. I um, I see that you have a chat uh, option. So women, I'm sure, love to talk to you about bathing suits and what they don't like about it, what their insecurities are. I mean, you must hear all kinds of stories in the course of your day, just of the course. business day. Yes, all the time. I just and you know, there's not a story I I haven't heard now. It's uh -huh. it's so and a lot of women you know they'll share and they'll say oh I have this thing like it's some you know they're all alone and what's wonderful is we're all in it together every woman not one woman has come in and said I'm perfect make yeah. a suit for me right every woman has a story yeah I would imagine even women that do have perfect bodies are sharing their insecurities of course, with you of course which really is you know when I share that with women it, it warms them to the idea that you know there is a problem in the industry it is kind of a cut one size fits all mm -hmm. and we're trying to fight against that mm hmm You've had some great marketing and advertising. Your, your suits have been featured in Sports Illustrated. You were the editor's pick in 2012. Your swimwear has been featured in that edition every year since. That's amazing, Britt. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Sports Illustrated was great. Not every year. We've missed a few. But we've been in the, the magazine several times, and yes. we were editor's pick. Um, and that was almost when we first opened, and it was just a great um, awakening into the industry um, and a realization that, you know, what we do uh, is detailed enough and, and exquisite enough to get noticed right off the bat. So that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. I also saw that you were in E! News. You, there was a video clip with you, and, and uh, you were speaking about bathing suit trends. Yes. Can you share a trend with us today? Yes, oh, off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, Really, I, I don't do trends too much. So okay. what I'm very interested in, though, is lift and support in the top. Okay. So when I have a client and I can make them feel lifted as if they are in an incredible push-up bra, but not too much, just enough, mm -hmm. um, every woman just is dazzled by that in the fitting room. The fact that it's not a thin strap, it actually lifts, supports, the fabric is dense and, and supple and, and holds, mm -hmm. as do our elastics on the side. So I'm very interested in... Um, the classic and timeless trend of fit. Mm -hmm. I really, I just have to push that. If I had to pick one, I will stick till that to that 
uh, for the rest of our business days. And I think that's the core of what every woman wants is a bathing suit that fits them. Absolutely. And they can feel like it fits and, it's, and it looks great on them. When you're tugging and pulling and kind of, you know, trying to adjust constantly, that's, that's not uh, helpful to confidence and feeling good in a suit. So we really make sure that it stays on, it fits, you put it on once and you don't have to touch it or worry about it the rest of the day. This is an interesting uh, insecurity that I think the male population at large doesn't understand, right? Right, right. They think, what's the big deal? Let's just go buy a, a bathing suit, pull it off the rack. I like the color. Yeah, you know, it'll do. Absolutely. But for women, it is such a significant piece, piece of clothing. Yes. And yes. it determines whether or not you're going to enjoy your vacation, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And some husbands get it. They come knocking at my door Christmas, all the holidays. They know that it makes their wife happy, and they want them to feel sexy and fabulous on a trip, so it's important to them. Others don't, but I salute the husbands and the, the boyfriends and the men out there that really get that it makes a difference in it, women's lives. It's fabulous. Yeah. So you have built a business. You are continuing to build this business. It's in a unique uh, space. Um, you're, you're manufacturing swimwear. You customize that swimwear. I mean, what, what don't you do in that swimming wear space, Britt? Brit? Is there something else you could be doing or that you could share with us or I don't do maternity suits yet mm -hmm. um, you know I've done them custom but I don't have them in the line so mm -hmm. one day uh, maternity I do custom also mastectomy suits but I don't have them in the line a lot of the reason is most women who um, are, are pregnant or you know have had a mastectomy they have specific very specific needs so I don't necessarily want to bring that into a volume space until I have more data mm -hmm. well you are a sensation you are such a, a force in the swimwear industry. You've done so well. So honored to have you on the show today. Thank you very much for not only fueling our economy with product and people that work for you, but also making women happier and so that they can enjoy those times in their life that requires wearing a swimsuit. Thank so you. thank you, Britt. Thank you so much, Susan. It's been an honor. You're welcome. And thank you for joining us today on Eye on Business. I'm Susan Howington, your host. Hope to see you again next time.